Thank you, Susan, and thank you for allowing me to come uh, and speak in the other Athens. <laughs> um, it has been, for me, like Bunyan's City on a Hill, because I first heard of it with, from my friend, uh, Professor Whitehead, who was born here, and kept telling us the great virtues of, of Southern society. Um, and so, first of all, I'm glad to be able to come at last to see this fabled town. And, and secondly, it's nice to be here to see um, Susan again, because um, I read her work I read her work before it was published, um, and it's always nice to find out what she's doing, and I've benefited considerably from it. Over 50 years ago, when I was an undergraduate, my first essay dealt with the question of why one should bother with the classics in 1962. Now, I won't say what my answer was, except that in my exuberant ignorance, I made the point that unlike many other disciplines, classic students dealt with a group of finite texts, finite material, apart from discoveries on papyrus. We knew all that we had to know. Now, my supervisor commented in the margin that this was not true of medicine and science. And my future biographer might well conclude that this little comment set me on a lifetime's adventure looking for texts in ancient medicine and science. Not least because the author of that squiggle in the margin was Sir Geoffrey Lloyd, who is today the greatest world expert on ancient science. Alas for the biographer, I completely forgot about that note made by my supervisor, and I'm quite prepared to say other undergraduates would have done the same. And it was 20 years later, when I was clearing out some old papers, that I discovered this injunction. And I didn't come to history of medicine via Geoffrey Lloyd. I came to it in a very different way by working on ancient inscriptions and working with archaeologists. But that marginal note is... Which way? Yep. Is also misleading. Because although there are many classical texts which are published, there are many new texts, and there are many neglected texts. There are many new texts, not least because some literally have been turning up in original Greek very recently, but there are others in translation into Arabic, into medieval Latin, into medieval Hebrew, and there were rumors of a text on ophthalmology in Armenian, uh, a language I confess I do not read. Um, but, and this is the point I want to make to all of you, much of what my work has consisted on over the last 50 years has been dealing with texts that have been in front of our eyes. They have been neglected. Why? They've been there. They've been there on the page. They've been cited 500 years ago. But they are totally unknown because they are written by my two most famous favorite authors after Galen. Anonymous and pseudo-Galen. I love pseudo-Galen. He really is a great chap. And because, and it seems to be something that's typical of classicists, and indeed of literary historians, begging your pardon, um, because as soon as we see that something is not by the famous author, we tend to put it on one side. We leave it. We think it's not important. 
Whereas my conviction is that by looking at these things without reference to the famous author, we may actually discover a good deal more about the past, about liter ancient literature, medieval Renaissance literature, than we ever expected. And secondly, and this is again, I think, something that classicists have a good deal, shall we say, to explain. If something is in translation, we don't, or rather certainly when I was young, we didn't like to use it. Classicists have a reputation for studying languages. And so if we find something translated by somebody else, we tend not to bother with it. Or rather, we do so surreptitiously. It's a thing we read underneath the bedclothes. Uh, Galen survives in translation. Arabic, Latin, and even in modern German translation, uh, there are 500 pages of which the only printed texts available are in a modern German translation from the Arabic, from the Syriac, from the Greek. Three or four removes from the original. And so classicists have run away from pseudo. They've run away from translated. And what I'm going to tell you about today is why one should look at some of these things and what we can learn from them. Now, very briefly, for those of you who are not students of Susan um, and don't know who Galen was, then here is a very, very brief biography. He's born in the year 129 AD at Pergamum, modern Bergama in western Turkey. He studied there. He went down the coast to Smyrna. He went to Alexandria in Egypt, which then was the greatest medical center. He comes back home in 162 to 166. He comes to Rome. And he says he made a great reputation for himself, such a reputation that his competitors hated him, and he was forced to leave Rome. And a parenthesis, I entirely agree with his competitors. He was a, well, four-letter word. Uh, he was always right, and he told you so. And you can see why his competitors did not like him. In 166, he was forced to flee. He went back to Pergamum. Two years later, he comes, he's recalled by the emperors, Marcus Aurelius and Aurelius Verus, Lucius Verus, to come back with them on military campaign. He joins them in camp, and the emperor, before they go on campaign, have a great disaster. Lucius Verus, the emperor, dies. Marcus Aurelius takes the body back to Rome, and all the camp, or at least the officials there, Return to Rome. He stays Galen among them, probably in 169, and he stays there for probably the rest of his life with interruptions. Marcus Aurelius wants to take him back on campaign, but Galen says, Oh, no, 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 the God forbids me. I've got to stay in Rome. And he acts as an imperial physician, probably for the rest of his life. We don't know when he died. It could be as late as 216. We don't know where he died. I think he could very well have died in Pergamum. But that's almost a minor point. What did he do? He writes in Greek. He wrote over 300 books. Makes my 13 look trivial. He didn't write, usually, in the sense which we use the word. He had people taking down words that he was speaking. So you take down my words accurately, please, and I would then take them up and use them and publish them. And that was a book. 
He wrote on anything from grammar, lexicography, anatomy, pharmacology, anything on medicine, philosophy, ethics. And even though his personal library was, was destroyed in a fire in Rome in 192, much of his writings survive today. Probably around 150 books. Now, the standard edition in Greek, and that, the easiest way of describing it to you is size. The standard edition today in Greek occupies three feet of space on my shelves. Three feet. Okay, half of it's in Latin translation, but nevertheless, a foot and a half is a substantial amount. There's another foot of material in Greek that has turned up since 1822. And there's another foot, at least, of books in translation. And there's more to come. I will can say with certainty that within the next 15 years, we are likely to have published another eight or nine inches worth of text, including a commentary on the Hippocratic text, Airs, Waters and Places, which is going to revolutionize our ideas on ancient seamanship, on the names for the winds, because Galen gains his information from going down to the docks and talking with ship's captains and so on. So there's more to come, which has been worked on mainly by Arabic experts. So, as they say, watch this space. But Galen presents as a problem. Three feet of Greek, let's say. And all the surviving medicine in Greek is either by Galen or it's by Hippocrates, his great hero, or it fills in gaps that Galen did not deal with. So Galen doesn't like women. So if you want to know about gynecology, you've got to read a book by a man called Serenus. Galen never wrote on botany or botanical plants. So that is why the Greek author Dioscorides survives. And the only works that, if you like, don't fall into those categories are works that survive under his name, my friend Pseudo Galen. And one of the great difficulties I've had, scholars have had, over the last 50 years is to try and find a context for Galen. Because if all you know about what is going on is one person, it's very difficult to understand, as historians, what is happening. And so one has to use the evidence of other historians. One's got to use the evidence of epigraphy, Latin and Greek inscriptions. One's got to use the evidence of archaeology in order to provide a context. And one has got to provide, find these other texts. And what I'm going to talk about today are some of these pseudo-texts, which are there, but which almost nobody has ever bothered to look at. Now, almost everybody here will have heard of the Hippocratic Oath. It is the most famous text surviving from antiquity. It's second only to the Bible in the number of times it's quoted. But did you know that there was actually an ancient commentary 
on the Hippocratic Oath, surviving under the name of Galen. Not, in, not entirely, it's only in fragments. But I think we may have about a third to a half of the original commentary in Arabic. It's an amazing text. It's written by somebody who came from or worked in the same town, the town as Galen. He comes from Pergamon. It's a man who writes in Greek. It's a man who is living at the same time as Galen. It's a man who knows the streets of Pergamum, who has visited the great temple of Asclepius. And if you go to Pergamum today, and it is one of the most spectacular cities of the ancient world, you can go out to the Asclepion, and you will find it as this author describes it. Who is it? Do we know who it is? Well, at one point I thought it was Galen, but I'm now convinced it's not, but it's by one of his teachers. And the reason I don't think it's by Galen is that Galen never uses the Hippocratic Oath in any of his surviving texts, never mentions it. And secondly, in the, his catalogue of his writings, he never mentions a commentary on the Hippocratic Oath. So we have something written by a man living, working in the same city at the same time. And it's a man, I think, called Pelops who taught Galen. Wow, it's his teacher. And what does it show us? One, this man is learned. Now, the fragments are not concerned with medical ethics. They don't talk about abortion. They don't talk about confidentiality. They don't talk about all those things which people cite the Hippocratic Oath for today. In part, because of the way these fragments have been transmitted, and the details are on the handout somewhere, the they are dealing with three things. The origin of medicine, the life of Hippocrates, and the life of the god Asclepius. Who invented medicine? Well, says this author, that the gods invented medicine, possibly. And the gods sent it to mankind in a dream. And each part of the world may have its own origins of medicine. Some people say it's the Greeks. Some people say it's the Egyptians. Some people say it's the Syrians. Some people say it's the Indians or the Persians or the Slavs. Slavs, it may be a misprint, maybe a mistranslation for Scythians, the North people in southern Russia, or even those mysterious inhabitants of Italy, the Etruscans. What's the origin of medicine? And this author quotes Greek geographers. He quotes Greek poetry. He quotes passages from Greek poetry that no longer exist. The life of Hippocrates, again, is fairly well known from surviving biographies of Hippocrates. So there's not much there. But with Asclepius, it's entirely different. We have new legends about Asclepius. And to my mind, the most fascinating topic comes right at the end, in which this man describes the statue of Asclepius at Pergamum, the great cult statue in the temple. And he uses the, the statue to explain how a doctor should behave. Why is there a snake on the, on the staff of Hippocrates? Because a snake 
can get rid of its skin. And medicine is ever-changing. A snake never sleeps. So the doctor must always be, I won't say awake, but alert. Why does the staff have leaves on it? Because medicine is ever-growing, ever-changing, and always bringing new life. And what is the cult symbol of Pergamum? What is the image on the statue that distinguishes Asclepius of Pergamum from the Asclepius of Rome, of Epidaurus, etc.? Any answers? It's an egg. And the god holds an egg in his hand. Why? Because the, the egg represents the world. And the doctor's job is to heal the world. And what's the worst thing you can do to an egg, which is drop it? An egg is fragile. The egg symbolizes you. You are likely to fall ill. We are all fragile. And so this author, let's call him Pelops, describes how a doctor should behave in terms of what he sees on the great cult statue at Pergamum. And as far as I know, there is not a single historian of ancient religion of a Sclepius cult who has ever referred to this text. And it's been in English for over 50 years. That's my first. My second is a book translated fairly recently, edited by Caroline Petit, which is called The Introduction to Medicine. It's quite long. It doesn't mention Galen, but we can tell it's contemporary because there will, it's, there's, it's some connection with a philosopher who lived at the time. It's Hippocratic because he believes in the medicine of Hippocrates, like Galen, but it's different from anything else we have in Greek from that period, in that half of it is to do with surgery. We know little about surgery in antiquity. We've got hundreds of instruments, but suddenly we have a text here which tells you how to do surgery. And there's nothing like it between the Roman author Celsus, 100 years previously, and a Greek author writing 500, 400 years later. This is a, a text on surgery, almost unknown, because it's pseudo, because it was only available until recently in Latin and Greek, and it's now available, I'm afraid, in French. But you can't have everything. And the rest of this talk I'm going to talk is about three texts to do with drugs. All of them are contemporary with Galen. All of them circulated in Greek under the name of Galen. One of them, which is on the virtues of the centauri plant, um, which is a, a famous herb, was translated in 1341 into Latin, but it was then lost in Greek. But it remained in Latin translation and used by pharmacologists. It's quoted in manuals of pharmacology right through into the 16th century. And the pharmacologists used it far more than scholars interested in what we call the complete works of Galen. Who are the authors? What can we say about the authors? Well, there were these three texts. There are two of them which are called on theriac. One's for a man called Piso, so I call that the Ad Pisonem. One dedicated to a man called Pamphilianus, that's my name, Pam, Ad Pamphilianum, and my text on Centauri. Who are the authors? Well, 
It's always good to live long enough to confess you made a mistake. Uh, and over 20 years ago, I concluded on the balance of probabilities that the ad personem was by Galen. Why? Because he's a Hippocratic author. He loves Plato, like Galen. He'd studied in Alexandria, where Galen studied. He came to Rome. He was associated with the imperial court from the 170s onwards for at least 35 years, like Galen. So we ha and I said, we have possibly, have we a choice? Was this man Galen? Or is it somebody who looks very much like Galen and has had his own career exactly like Galen? Now, in the last three or four years, uh, there's been a PhD thesis and there's been a group working in France on it. And it now seems to me quite clear that this cannot be by Galen. It's the wrong language and so on. I'll say a little bit more about it. But basically, all those ticks, all the things we use when we write, all the things I use when I speak, the ums and errs and the uh, you know this and all the things which you find in Galen, genuine, are not there in this author. And whereas Galen writes in, at times, long sentences, this man can hardly finish a sentence. He goes on and on. And I said, we're either dealing with a Galen who's senile, uh, or we've got a genuine, a, a new author, contemporary, who did the same thing. And I think now, on the balance of probabilities, this author is not Galen. The second text on the centauri is written by a Greek who had lived and studied and studied in Rome. I'm coming back to this. And he's got a medical brother called Papias somewhere in the Greek world. And for those of you who, who don't know what I'm talking about, he's a Methodist author, and I'll explain that in a moment. Methodist does not mean he's a follower of John Wesley or anything like that. It just mean, means that he followed a particular method. And the final one is also a Greek. The author was a Greek who lived, studied in Rome about AD 200. We know that because there's a citation from this book about 25 years later, and he too was connected with the court administration. So we've got three authors, all living in Rome at the same time as Galen. And between them, they tell us about the city of Rome. Now, when you were brought up to listen to hear about Rome, we all think of Rome being inhabited by people who spoke Latin. Half the city of Rome spoke Greek. Their Rome by 150 AD was a Greek city. People spoke Greek. The emperor wrote in Greek. And Rome is now a center of education for Greeks. The author of <clears throat> the Ad Pamphilianum says he had a teacher called Mycius Aelianus. You can't get a more Roman sounding name than that who taught him about plague, and who taught him about theriac. I'll explain about theriac in a moment. The author of the text on the centauri 
says he had Roman teachers. One of them was a man called Apollonius, a man, he says, a witty man, prone to making jokes, clearly a good professor. Um, he was highly approved. And this man also, I think, was a Methodist author. Now, Methodism, following the method, was something that was, grew up in Rome. People began to study it, invent it, in Rome. It was brought by Greeks, who, made by Greeks who lived in Rome, and it became the most popular type of medicine. Galen complains at one point that nobody believes in his Hi Hippocratic medicine anymore. Instead, it's Methodist medicine. And this man begins his treatise rather like communists in the 1960s with references to Marx and Engels. The very first sentence refers to Semisone, the great teacher. And Themisone is the founder of Methodism. So we have a sort of second century AD equivalent of Marx and Engels. These people studied in Rome. Now you can't imagine a fourth century BC Athenian coming to Rome to study anything. Here we have Rome developing as an educational center for Greeks. But let's have a look at the authors a little more. The author of the Ad Pamphylianum lives and studies in Rome. He's actually moved away. He, his description of, uses the past tense. I saw this, not I see this. And he dedicates his book to a Cretan, a Greek, who must be living back in Rome, I think, who has served in Egypt and who served in Crete. And these three texts also tell us about culture. They tell us about who they knew, who they worked with. The author of the text for Piso mentions a female philosopher, Aria, a Platonist philosopher most dear to me. Um, if, if some people who thought this text was genuine Galen believed this was Galen's girlfriend, um, but she happened to be married. Um, he's a friend of a man called Elias Antipater, whom we know from other sources. We have a biography of him. And he was the equivalent today of a chat show host. He was a man people flocked to hear speak. He was a man with great charisma. And he became the Greek secretary to the Roman emperors. So clearly this author is very much associated with the highest circles. And what about the author, this text, for Pamphilianus? Well, we haven't really got much beyond that, that Cretan as an example. But what you can see is that this man has had a good education. He writes the most incredibly flowery Greek. He writes, it's as if he was, he was almost writing poetry at times. He uses language that we find in honorary inscriptions. And the author of De Virtuti, which is a much shorter text, although it's small, and although it doesn't survive in Greek, you can see it is extraordinarily well organized, well put together, I want to say a little bit more about Piso, the author of the text from Piso, because this is a good example of how Greeks 
are being incorporated into the Roman Empire. And how, if you like, you can't draw a distinction between Latin and Greek. He's learned. He is a Greek. He quotes Homer. He quotes Plato. He quotes Euripides, Hecuba, I think. So he's had the good Greek education. Interestingly, the three medical examples that he gives are all taken from famous incidents in Roman history. He talks about Hannibal. And you've probably heard of Hannibal, the Carthaginian, who almost captured Rome, and who at the end of his life was in service with a Greek monarch out in the Greek East. There's a story of King Mithridates, Mithridates the poisoner, and the story that is told, and it takes two pages, is the story of how Mithridates, to protect himself, took theriac, this antidote, this anti-poison drug, and he took it daily. And by the time he came, wanted to commit suicide, when the Romans had defeated him, he couldn't. No poison worked. So he had to bring in a slave to kill him. And this author actually gives you the name of the slave. And finally, Cleopatra. And incidentally, did you know that Cleopatra taught Galen? No. Did you know that Cleopatra's beauty book survives? And if any young ladies would like to know Cleopatra's beauty book, come and see me afterwards and I will tell you for a fee, uh, how to use cosmetics. Cleopatra was famous as a writer of pharmacology. And this text taught is the longest account of her death. It names the slaves who attended her. It talks about how she used the asp to, to commit suicide. And it's one of the sources for Shakespeare. Um, these are Roman stories. They're also known in Greek, but these are primarily Roman stories. And they're written by a cultured Greek who ends with, I hope you will find it, a witty ending. Um, and I shall just quote, because he says, the last page, you've got to amend the text a little bit, and he says he was the judge. And it's not clear whether he's judge at a trial or judge at an academic debate. And he says, uh, the, he comes to the end of his, the last, sent, last paragraphs, he said, and Paizo, you know how things can come to an end, should come to an end. He said, because when you were this judge, you had these speak speakers in front of you who were going on. They continued to find many, many occasions to continue the argument long after it might have been regarded as settled. And so you remarked, even the gods are silent between prophecies. Oracles can fall silent. Winter storms make the sea unsailable. Rivers dry up and flow again, while even the earth does not produce her fruits continuously. Hence the necessity and the propriety of knowing when to stop and of coming to a swift conclusion, as I shall do. Now, this is a wonderful ending to the book. It's, it, it's literary, it's rhetorical, it appeals to Paiso, and so on. Culture. Cultivated prose. And finally, these texts on drugs are also interesting because they are texts of a sort that we have lost. They're texts about a single drug on the centauri or theriac. They're texts about a panacea. Centauri cover, cures everything. C 
cures internal diseases, cures external diseases, wounds, bites, gladiators, sword th cuts, women's diseases, and in particular, snake bites. And if you want to understand ancient snake law, this is the text for you. Lots and lots and lots of snakes are mentioned. It's something that you can use. The author tells you how to make centauri, the, how, to, how to take it, how to cut it, how to use it, how to make it into a drink, a poultice, etc. It's a universal cure. And the other two texts are on theriac. Theriac is an ancient word which means animal drug. It's a drug that can be used against animal and snake bites. But, says both authors, it's a universal cure. It's not just a tonic. It's not just an antidote. It's a tonic. You can use it all the time. Marcus Aurelius took a daily dose. Septimius Severus, in fact, we know from Galen, liked to take it as that sort of thing, a tonic you take in the morning. But, say both authors, you can use it for everything. And they give you a long list, including mental diseases. And they say just keep using it, because once it gets old, it loses its power. I've taken it. It was a horrible, dark, brown, sticky substance that came from the souk in Damascus. Um, it worked. I'm still alive 50 years later. Um, but say these authors, you can use it for everything. But there's a problem. Who are the people who go around offering drugs? and say, this will cure you of everything. Now, in America, you have television. You have people offering you cures on the television. You have snake oil salesmen. And as soon as you go around saying you've got a wonderful, remarkable drug that can cure everything, you run into the accusation that you're a snake oil salesman, that you're a charlatan, and the Greek word is crowd puller. You bring them in, you stand in the marketplace and you say, look, look, this is how you, you know, this wonderful cure. And as soon as you go around saying, I've got this wonder cure, well, people are going to disbelieve you. Do you believe everything you see on television? Of course not. Do you believe Mr. Trump? No. This is the same for antiquity. And so these authors have got to distinguish themselves from the snake oil salesman. Galen says, my cures are not miraculous. They're Hippocratic. These people say, my cures are effective, but that's not good enough. So what they do is they appeal to the status of the person. These people who are vouching for my treatise are the highest members of society. Or they're well known. Brother Papias, this Greek, the brother of the author of De Vertutibus, is a Greek physician somewhere. And it's very curious that we know of a Greek physician living at the same time as Galen called Papias, whose brother, or certainly relative, close relative, happens to be a colleague of Galen in the imperial court at the same time and happens to be a Methodist author. Is, is this royal doctor the author? I don't know. But they, ex 
They all claim to expertise. I have learned this. Look what I have learned. Look at my teachers. Look. I'm not a snake oil salesman. The author of De Virtutibus says, when I heard about all this, I just refused to believe it. And my teacher, Apollonius, once used the drug. And he sent a slave. He said, bring me some centauri. And I thought he was joking. He said, because he was well known for practical jokes. Homo erit valde simplex. He was a very witty man. And I couldn't believe him. But of course, I've seen it work. I've done all these cures. I've seen this. And the people who support me are very distinguished indeed. Valde approbati. And besides, if you look at what I write, I'm learned. I can quote Homer. I can quote earlier pharmacologists. I can quote you a long list of authorities. I know the name of the slave who killed Mithridates. I'm a learned man. Believe me. Now, if all professors went out like that, I'm not quite sure what we would do with med medicine today, but I'm learned, believe me. And similarly, how you write Greek tells you something about the person you are. I can speak in long sentences, and I can speak without hesitation, repetition, or whatever, which shows I am a learned man. Believe me. I'm a good preacher. All these are there to show that the author of this book on a miraculous drug is not a snake oil salesman. He's not somebody who's going around to sell you a drug, as one of these crowd pullers did, to murder your grandmother. Um, so what have we got? These are texts. They're there. Four of them have been accessible in print since at least 1490. The Arabic commentary is more recent. Nobody has really bothered with them since about the year 1550. But what they do is they provide us with different perspectives. They provide us with a, an antidote, if you like, to Galen. They show Greeks, like Galen, coming to Rome, coming to Rome even via Alexandria. They remind us of Greek culture in the Roman world, how important Greek was even in the capital of Rome. They remind us of a medical world that we wouldn't otherwise know about. These texts on single drugs are almost unique. There's one called On the Vulture, which is clearly a sort of magical text. And there's another one written about 500 AD. But we wouldn't otherwise know about these little texts because over the centuries, why bother spending time and money and parchment copying out a single text when you could copy out at the same time a very large book of drugs? We are lucky to have these. They're an example of something which we know from papyri, there are a couple of examples there, must have existed but have long since disappeared. And finally, Galen, to my mind, and I've spent 50 years or more reading Galen. Galen is one of the most brilliant authors. He's one of the most fascinating authors. And Susan's books will tell you how fascinating he is from the point of view of the social climate in which he works. But these books do something 
that nobody, nobody else can do. They help us fill in that context. They help us see that Galen is not perhaps quite as unique as he wants us to believe. His opponents are not quite as stupid, as idiotic. And they also show us that he's not the only Greek who went to Alexandria and then came back to Rome and became an imperial position. So, thank you. <laughs>